My name is Leslie Gavea, and I am a proud member of Cox, Citizens Against the Rehoboth Compressor Station. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking each and every one of you for coming out tonight and supporting this very important cause, something that's pretty much eaten up a lot of all of our time. We're passionate about this, and clearly you are too. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that tonight is really the last event, it's not really, it is, the last event before our non-binding vote here in Rehoboth, Monday, uh, April 3rd. So how many Rehoboth residents do we have in, okay. I would urge you, we are right down to the wire, I would urge you this weekend, if you haven't said hello to your neighbors in a while, to please, please, please get out there. <coughs> Remind them about April 3rd to vote no, no compressor station here in Rehoboth. And I also wanted to mention the wonderful help we've gotten from the, the great folks in Attleboro and Seekonk. Together, we've, we've really built one heck of a partnership, and it's one that we're very proud of, so thank you. We have a pretty special night tonight um, with some awesome guests. And thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, we're going to hear a couple of presentations, um, and what I think I would like to do now is introduce our speakers. So our first speaker is going to be Elizabeth Mahoney. Elizabeth, can we have a round of applause for Elizabeth? <laughs> Elizabeth is an assistant attorney general and senior policy advisor for uh, energy at the office of attorney general Maura Healy. Elizabeth works within the Energy and Telecommunications Division, and she previously served at the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources in the office of State Senator Ben Downing. So um, we're so grateful to have you with us tonight. Thank you. We're also going to hear from um, Dr. Susan Racine. Thank you, doctor. Please stand up. Dr. Racine is a board-certified internist practicing primary care in Boston. She's a member of Mass Healthcare Providers Against Fracked Gas, the Massachusetts Medical Society, and the American College of Physicians. And she is committed to working on ecological, ecological health as well as the health of individuals. And thank you for everything that you do. Thank you, doctor. And we also have Casey Tenerowitz, so Casey is a family nurse practitioner who works at Dot House Health, a community health center in Dorchester. And uh, Casey lives in Marshfield, Massachusetts. Um, and she's excited to increase her involvement in environmental issues and public health by participating in tonight's discussion. We welcome you and thank you so much for being here. So thank you. So without further ado, um, Elizabeth, would you like to come up? First, um, thank you all for having me. Um, it's great to, to be here. We've, our office um, has talked in a bunch of communities in the last couple of years. We've been to Akushnet. Um, we've been to Sharon um, up in the North Shore. Certainly a lot of work out in the western part of the state. Um, so I'm glad to be down here in Rehoboth. We haven't been here yet, so um, when Tracy asked for our office to be able to come down here, we were glad to, to be able to make it. Um, I'll start with an apology. I left my office in Boston this morning, with my, or this afternoon, with my sneakers on, ran to the train, <laughs> and forgot some shoes. Uh, so apologies. Um, but so while we're figuring this out, um, I'll talk about, uh, I think, pretty much why uh, Tracy wanted our office to participate in one of your meetings. Uh, as you probably know, a couple of years ago, uh, in 2015, um, a question was posed to the Department of Public Utilities. Oh, let me explain. I'm, I'm from the Attorney General's office, but I work in the Energy and Telecom Division. My division is also known as the Office of Ratepayer Advocate. So we do a lot of work on utility issues, really traditional utility work like rate making. We're in the middle of a huge Eversource rate case right now. Um, we were involved in a, a national grid rate case last year. 
Um, so we do kind of that nitty gritty, direct ratepayer advocacy work, but then we do get into a lot of the other type of utility related questions that go on uh, in the Commonwealth, particularly when it comes to public policy type issues. Um, so in 2015, this question was posed to the Department of Public Utilities, can the electric utilities purchase gas capacity to serve their electric customers? So that was a question of, can an electric company buy gas capacity? And I know you guys are all educated on this issue. You've heard a lot about this. Um, it was quite a big topic for a while. So we, that started in the spring of 2015. And when the question was posed, it was posed for a number of reasons. There, there, some people said, we need gas capacity to, for electric generation to help um, make sure we ha keep the lights on. We need it to drive down the cost of electricity. We need it because during the winter, um, we have such cold winters here and we don't have enough pipeline capacity. So there were a lot of reasons that the electric companies were, of course, trying to promote this pipeline. Um, or the, the concept of electric ratepayers paying for gas capacity. Typically, gas customers pay for gas capacity, and then they use that gas capacity to heat their homes, to cook their food, yada, yada. So the, the question was moving very quickly through the Department of Public Utilities. And in that summer, our office opposed the question and said, no, the law doesn't support that. And so the department shouldn't support it. And around that time, as we were battling it out through briefs and comments and questions, we decided, our office decided, well, everyone's talking about this for price, for reliability. Let's call the real question that needs to be asked. Do we need gas capacity for electric reliability? And so we, our office, engaged in a study. and. We brought in outside experts to conduct the study, really well-known national leading experts on, um, on the issue outside our office, technical math people. We're lawyers. We're not math people. If this doesn't work, it's OK. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a computer person. Um, so we asked the question. We, engaged a stakeholder process. Um, I think there were 17 um, members uh, of this kind of advisory committee to help inform the questions and the inputs going into the study. And in November of 2015, our study showed that in fact, we didn't need additional gas capacity to meet our electric reliability needs. And in fact, we found that in the small circumstances where we um, found that there may have been a couple of hours here and there over the next 15 years, and I think it was something south of 100 hours in the next 15 years. In those circumstances, we asked the next question, well, if we're going to have s s uh, small reliability issues, how do we meet that reliability? And how, how do we meet it so that it's the most cost-effective way to ha produce electricity and meet our clean energy standards, our, our Global Warming Solutions Act standards, which talks about um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And what the study found was, first again, we don't have a reliability issue. And secondly, to meet any remaining questions of reliability issues, we should, the, the most cost effective way is through energy efficiency and demand response. So it was an answer that hadn't been given yet, and it certainly hadn't been given by the pipeline owners. Um, so it was, it was a really good discussion point that surprised a lot of people. Um, but so that kind of drove a lot of the activity that we've been doing since November of 2015. So we have taken that information and said, how do we implement this? How do we drive more clean energy? How do we drive more energy efficiency? How do we get more demand response? Demand response, um, I'm sure everybody, uh, hopefully everybody knows about energy efficiency. Hopefully everybody has had an energy efficiency audit. Who, who has had an energy efficiency audit? Nice. 
This is the time, guys and gals. <laughs> Sign up for an energy efficiency audit and get your light bulbs and get your, um, all of your good insulation. Do it. You're paying for it already, so take advantage. We also need you because of this study. Um, so we found, let's work on these issues. Um, demand response is a program that typically a lot of big businesses tend to take, take part in, um, and it's a, a con contractual relationship with um, either your utility or ISO New England where you say, if there's an event, that's a term that's used at our regional electric grid. If there's an event where we need a lot of electricity and we maybe don't have enough generation, I volunteer to lessen my electricity for a certain amount of time. So that's done today. We'd like to see it done much, much more. And we'd like to actually see demand response be enveloped into our, um, our energy efficiency program. So when we're thinking about how do we reduce, you know, how do we use the right light bulbs, how do we smartly use our electricity, we'd like to see demand response. So we've been advocating for that um, in the statewide energy efficiency plans. Um, but I'm sorry that this didn't work out. But so that's been our, our kind of our real focus. Um, some great slides in here, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll share them um, with Tracy, and then you can post them and share them. We found that the co most cost-effective way of doing this is through energy efficiency and demand response. So we looked at hydroelectric from Canada or New York. We looked at pipelines. We looked at um, hydroelectric on both existing lines and new transmission lines, because if you have any family or friends in New Hampshire, you may have heard of Northern Pass. They don't necessarily like it up there in uh, New Hampshire. It's going to be a big transmission line through, running through their state, so it's a challenge. Um, Which one is it? It's, I named it Rehoboth Presentation. Yeah. Oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Technology. Um, and what else? What else? Oh, LNG, liquefied natural gas. Um, so, like I said, we looked at a bunch of things, and we found oh, perfect. we found that, um, of, again, uh, energy efficiency and demand response were the best. Um, if you can, I can, yeah. This is a picture of, you guys probably know this, but our electric uh, generation over the last 15 years has switched from coal-fired oil to natural gas and that's part of going back to the reasons why the pipeline was being pushed was if half of our generation is coming from gas we need to have more gas capacity um, again our study didn't say that yeah okay. so here are all this, the pipelines that you guys this this is a slide and again this is all on our website um, I can send the link so you guys can look at it, um, if, or if you go to mass.gov slash AGO, you can get to all of this information. And this is the, all the different um, scenarios we looked at in, in terms of solutions. So the top right-hand side is the, the green box. That's what I'm talking about with energy efficiency and demand response. It will produce the, the most ratepayer savings and a good amount of carbon reductions. You can look at natural gas pipelines, um, less, we, we found less in ratepayer savings and much higher in CO2. Um, and then down here, this is something, turns out I'm, I've turned to actually working on in the office, is um, energy efficiency and low carbon imports with new power lines. So that's again probably hydroelectric. There's a lot of ratepayer savings. Hundreds, not as much as energy efficiency, still a lot of repair savings and quite a bit of CO2 saved. Um, since this report was done, the legislature has required the utilities to go out and procure large amounts of clean energy, so we should see an RFP <coughs> request for proposals come from the utilities on that tomorrow, breaking news. Um, and we'll see in the next couple of months if there are projects that make sense. And again, that's going to be probably base load electricity. So in the winter when gas is being used to heat homes, we'll be getting hydroelectric uh, energy or perhaps other types of renewable energy to serve our needs. 
Um, so that's that's kind of breaks down all the things we looked at. Um, this is the newest information from ISO New England. ISO New England is the regional electric grid. They are solely responsible for making sure that the lights stay on in New England. They don't, they're agnostic as to type. They're agnostic as to price. They just want to keep the lights on. Um, so they also measure energy efficiency and other things. Um, so you see the, the orange and yellow lines at top, those, that would be generation orange is generation just as is. The yellow line includes PV, so solar production in the region. And then when you include energy efficiency, you see how much less electricity we need over time. And this is out to 2025. Thanks. Um, this is another counter to, and this is a new slide as well. This is another counter to the argument that we need gas pipelines for um, energy savings, that the price of electricity is much too high. This is our, the cost of wholesale electricity over the last 10 years. Uh, the 2016 number is still preliminary, but you can see there were a couple of spikes. 2007 and 8 was before any gas reserves in, the, um, in Pennsylvania and other places entered into the system. So we've seen a, the gas price has reduced electricity prices. And you see in 2014 when we had the polar vortex, if you remember it was a really, really cold winter. We had, um, so we were using gas for heating. Um, there was a propane situation where um, there wasn't actually enough, a lot of propane in the region because a, a propane cavern collapsed in Ohio and a propane train derailed in Canada. So that limited our supplies and it hurt our heating. So people had to turn to electricity to heat. So a lot of things went together that winter to drive up the, the price of electricity. But you've, you see 2015, 2016 dramatic drops. Um, and 2015, was that the terrible winter of snow? I mean, yes. that was? So even with all that snow, we dropped our cost of electricity. And something that is really technical, and I apologize, um, Part of our electricity costs, you can see the green, is called the capacity market. That's something run by the ISO New England. They do these three-year projections. So we know who's going to be delivering power to us in 2020. They had an auction in February. Everyone comes in and says, I will be on. If you need me, I will be there and I will deliver electricity. And it's an auction, so it's price driven. Well, the auction in February was the lowest that we've had in, in the last 10 years. So we're going to see an even smaller green bar in, th in 2020. Unfortunately, because of what happened in 2013 and 2014, this year's capacity payments are going to be tough. They're going to be difficult. It's something that um, our commercial and industrial customers feel more than us as residential ratepayers, but we've, we've our uh, analysis shows that this is going to be the worst year. And we just need to, unfortunately, get through it. But the good news is that projecting out the next couple of years, every year those capacity payments are going down. So that's good for our wallets. But it's also really great, a really great indication of what the electric markets can produce for us. And that's being done without any new uh, pipelines. So that was our study. That was our... Those were our arguments um, when the uh, a and &E, the, um, the, the pipeline contracts were filed at the DPU that we were fighting against last summer. We had a great case. We felt like we had a really great case before the Department of Public Utility. We had awesome experts. We felt like we were going to really push back on those contracts. At the same time, as you probably know, um, the question that DPU had answered back in 2015, can electric companies do this? was questioned at this uh, Supreme Ju Judicial Court. Um, DPU had to defend their decision. We um, typically, we defend state actors in court. We are the ratepayer advocate, but we're also the, the state's attorney. And, but we chose in this case that we did not, our, our reading of the law didn't align with the Department of Public Utilities, so we declined to represent them. Um, and so they, they hired counsel, and instead we actually filed an amicus brief and testif we, um, 
briefed at the S SJC um, on the, the question. Other attorneys um, that brought the case obviously testified as well. Um, and the great news was in August of, of last year, you, you know that the S Supreme Ju Judicial Court decided that in fact the statutory language that the department had relied on did not grant the authority to electric companies to contract for gas pipelines. So that's the NG decision. Um, we were, of course, ecstatic because it backed up what we had been saying for over a year, um, and it eliminated um, one way to pay for pipelines. We really, you know, we, we don't think that there's a reliability issue. We think that there are more cost-effective solutions to meeting our electric needs, and we didn't think that the statute met the standard. We didn't think that electric ratepayers should be paying for that type of service. So that was NG, um, and so that meant that our a the A and E dockets at DPU were dismissed. Our great case that we had, all that work, um, was for good, but we never got to see it through. Some of my colleagues were really disappointed. They were ready to really ask some good questions on cross-examination. You know, lawyers, they kind of get nerdy. Um, and so, but the SJC settled it for us. So, at this, also last spring, the legislature uh, decided that um, while these questions were swirling, that they wanted to encourage more clean energy generation to come into Massachusetts. So at this point, they're requiring um, their, our electric companies to procure hydroelectric, up to 1,200 megawatts of hydroelectric or clean energy generation, and um, offshore wind. And so that offshore wind is 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind. We're looking, the legislature in this bill, and it was supported by the governor and many environmental groups, um, even to some extent the electric companies, um, they were all looking to, they're all looking to start an offshore wind energy, um, industry in Massachusetts, hopeful of bringing in um, cost-effective clean energy, but also starting an industry, promoting jobs, a lot of those fishermen down in New Bedford who have been struggling, maybe they can drive boats for this industry while they're building and, and um, repairing and, and that. So, like I said, tomorrow hopefully that RFP is going to come out on hydroelectric energy, and so we'll see what happens there, and hopefully we'll get some really good prices on, on clean energy for, for our state and for our ratepayers. And then starting in July, they're going, there's going to be a process to procure or buy offshore wind. Um, these are going to be long, these really will be long term. It's going to take a while for this to get off the ground, especially offshore wind. I don't think we'll have turbines in the water until 2024, 2025, other than a small project that's in, in, um, in effect in Rhode Island right now. But so those were two pieces. That was some legislation that our office thought fit well in with our study. It was clean energy, if we can find it cost effectively, this is something for us to meet some of our other statutory mandates with respect to uh, carbon and, and other things. And then just my last slide, I, I talked a little bit about this, but you know, our office as a rate pair advocate, um, in addition to that traditional rate case, you know, rate making, um, topic that we cover. We, we've been working on a lot of other things. I talked about energy efficiency. We've got a lot going on in the gas arena with um, for gas customers and gas companies and how they, they get their gas and how they plan. Um, we've got a, a robust solar program in Massachusetts. We're coming to the end of one program. We're looking at how do we fund and, and frame the next program. And uh, so we've been working uh, with DOER on how to do that and making sure that it is accessible for any ratepayer and also less expensive than it's been. And we think that it can be done. Um, a, an issue that our office also works on, um, so EEB at the top stands for Energy and Environment Bureau. My division sits within that bureau. Maura Healy, the Attorney General, when she came into office, she brought energy and environment under the same umbrella. Um, thinking that those really should pair well together and should be thought about together. Um, so EEB, especially our Environmental Protection Division, 
works on Article 97 issues, and that's uh, obviously protected lands, um, state or, or locally protected <coughs> lands for um, environmental or, or recreational purposes. Um, we've had some tough goes with that, but we continue to um, argue that the state under its constitu constitutional right under Article 97 should be the entity deciding whether or not the use of an Article 97 land, the use of protected land should be or can be changed for some other purpose. These, these lands do tend to change over time. Say a school's being built and there's parkland that needs to be converted for the good of the school, the good of the town, um, that, that's a some, somewhat regular occurrence as long as whatever land you're taking over is replaced somewhere else. It's called no net loss policy. But the question that's come up with respect to pipelines is who gets to decide who changes Article 97 when a pipeline's coming in? Um, Unfortunately, uh, a court last year said that um, the Federal Gas Act rules, and so that FERC gets to decide that. Um, we were really disappointed with that ruling, but we haven't given up in fighting for Article 97. And just earlier this month, we filed an amicus brief on a separate uh, non-pipeline associated Article 97 issue out in the western part of the state to really argue that the state should be controlling the decision making on Article 97 and that there's really a really great process involved in that. The legislature's involved, um, the governor's office is involved, there's money that has to be exchanged, there's that no net loss policy. So even if you change the use of some land, you're still going to protect the same amount of land. Um, and then, of course, the attorney general is a consumer uh, advocate for the state as well. We look at that in terms of competitive supply, so you can get your energy from anyone. Your, your electric is delivered by your utility, but you can get your energy from any anyone. And we want to make sure that how that's sold to consumers is done in the right way, that you're not being tricked, that um, unfair and nefarious tactics aren't being used, and that the prices that you're being offered are being offered honestly. Um, and then same thing with solar contracts. We've, we're really in favor of solar, but we want to make sure that you all, when you're being sold solar, are being sold the truthful package. And so it's something that we, we keep an eye on. And then lastly, energy storage. What can energy storage do in the future for our state, and how can that be paired with clean energy so that we always have energy available to us? Um, clean energy, locally produced energy, all that good stuff. Energy storage right now is coming, it's up and coming, but it's still, still expensive, so we're all working on it. Um, but I think in the next 10 years, that's really going to be a boom to the state. Um, and so uh, that's, thank you. Sorry about the technical issues. Tracy, I did that prior to this, but I'll do it again. Okay. April 3rd, we have a non-binding vote here in Rehoboth. It's critical that we all get out and vote no on the compressor station. Talk to your friends, anybody in Rehoboth, even if you haven't talked to them in a while, talk to them over the weekend. Bring them, bring them a donut from Confectionery Designs, local. <laughs> Marie Soliday, owner in the back. Love that about you. So, Dr. Racine, thank you. Casey, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That would be great. So, good evening. Casey and I are happy to be here, and um, we are both practicing in Boston in primary care, and so we're. We're volunteers here tonight. We're not getting any kickbacks from the solar industry or the wind industry. <laughs> We're just here because of our commitment to human health. And um, I, for one, have been affected by the push to develop pipeline infrastructure projects here in Massachusetts, because I live in West Roxbury. And I don't know if you're familiar with what went on in West Roxbury, but we kind of lost our fight. We have a 
FERC saw fit to put a high-pressure pipeline with a metering and regulating station um, in the middle of a densely populated neighborhood less than 0.6 miles from five different schools, one of which my son attended, and um, right across the street from an actively blasting quarry. So we have dynamite right across from the street from a high-pressure pipeline, just like right across the street. There's also a nursing home within a half mile of this. And, um, what could go wrong? What could go wrong, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> so um, nothing my mom would approve of, but that's um, in that struggle fighting against this um, poorly designed idea, I've um, learned a lot about the lack of governmental safeguards in the protection of human health when it comes to fossil fuel projects, unfortunately. And I've also learned a lot about the um, health implications of natural gas infrastructure, and I'll be happy to share those with you this evening. Um, and, but first, um, Casey's going to start us off. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Casey Tenerowitz, and I am a nurse practitioner at a community health center in Dorchester. Uh, I am part of a group called Massachusetts Healthcare Providers Against Fracked Gas. And just like Dr. Racine, I am not getting any money to be here. Um, so I volunteered to speak tonight simply because I'm concerned about public health risks associated with the com proposed compressor station in your community. Scientifically, I know that air quality significantly impacts human health, and as a nurse practitioner, I think that I have an obligation to advocate for protecting for the health of all people. So tonight, I hope to fulfill that obligation uh, by providing you with information that you can use to educate your neighbors, politicians, and friends about the compressor station that's being proposed for your community. Yes. <laughs> Tonight, Susan and I are going to review these three main topics. So first, I will briefly review how a compressor station works. Then I will hand it over to Susan, who will discuss what type of pollution the compressor station will likely produce and what health risks are associated with that pollution. So this slide is just a reminder of what the... Um, Spectra Algonquin pipeline, where it lies. What it does is it brings uh, fracked and processed gas from the south up north to New England, including Massachusetts. And gas travels this distance under very high pressure. So compressor stations are needed every 40 to 100 miles along the pipeline in order to maintain the pressure that's needed for the gas to move forward. Essentially, the compressor station is a gigantic engine. So as I was looking at your no compressor station sign, I thought you could also remind your friends and neighbors, you could simply say, no giant engine in my backyard. Um, and that giant engine is needed to help distribute the gas. So the blue box is just highlighting where you all are, and that's where the proposed uh, Rehoboth compressor station sits. Uh, Spectra wants to expand its gas lines and it needs more compressor stations to do so. So how nice that they thought of Rehoboth while they were trying to accomplish their goals. And these are the three expansions along the Algonquin pipeline. So uh, Dr. Racine was talking about West Roxbury which falls under the Algonquin incremental market and you all fall under Access Northeast. And this slide is a map, it, I hope you can see it. The blue area is the um, proposed compressor station. The red lines are the gas lines. And the small, you, the curvy lines are your streets and there's little tiny black dots on there that are houses. So these are all the people who are living very close to that. And as you are well aware, this is sitting in the corner of Rehoboth, very close to Seekonk and Attleboro. So the, these next three slides are just for your understanding of what a compressor station looks like. This is an interior view, obviously. And so this is the giant engine. And, um, 
when I first heard about compressor stations, I imagined these random boxes that are sometimes on the corner of streets that seem to whir, and I see utility trucks at them sometimes. Uh, but I think it's important to remember that as you're talking to your neighbors and friends, this, that is not what this is. Uh, this will be intrusive to your neighborhood. So this is a picture taken of a compressor station in Colorado. Um, as you can see, it does not blend in naturally, aside from maybe the brown color of the pipe. Um, this it doesn't show that there's usually also storage tanks for waste and fuel. Um, the, let's see here. Oh, the one major difference would be that in your neighborhood, there would be homes in the background. So this is taken uh, at least from the perspective that this is sort of in the middle of nowhere, but if you remember the map, there were all those little dots and that's where families and people live. You can go to the next slide. And this is merely for perspective. In the foreground, you can see a home that looks very little, but I think if you look closely, it looks like a cape with a nice porch. And behind it is the compressor station. So again, important to remember the size, the look of this, um, and People have different reasons for opposing a compressor station. Maybe not everybody is buying into the public health risks the way I do, but your neighbor really might buy into what it's going to do to the look of your community. So these are pretty large projects. And this final slide of mine is just covering the um, parts of a compressor station an engine, turbine, dehydrator, separator, a condensate storage tank, a gas heater and cooler, a backup generator, and a pipe yard. And um, just keep in mind that because the gas is constantly running through the pipeline, the compressor station is always working. So the giant engine is always running, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it does create both noise and air pollution. So that is um, what I would consider, if this was my community, I would consider that a threat to my community and my health. And now uh, Dr. Racine is going to take over with her part. So um, I got a lot of my material from Mass Healthcare Providers Against Frat Gas um, founding father Kurt Norgard, and many of these are his slides. And I've also gotten material from Physicians for Social Responsibility who've written a huge compendium on the risks and harms of fracking. And this is their conclusion. And if you need to leave early, this is going to be the summary of my, of my talk tonight. Um, compressor stations and pipelines are major sources of air pollutants raising potential health risks for those nearby while offering no offsetting economic benefits. Indeed, they are associated with loss of tax revenue and the economic development for the communities in which they are cited. So that's kind of bad news. <laughs> um, and I was going to go through some um, basics about natural gas. It's called natural gas, but most of the gas in the United States now is fracked, and that is a totally unnatural um, process for getting gas out of the earth. It involves injecting large volumes, huge volumes, of water laden with chemicals under high pressures into the earth to break up the shale that encases the methane, the natural gas, which is the fuel that the um, companies are looking for. But the gas that they um, produce ends up bringing up with itself all those chemicals, or most of those chemicals, and radioactivity from deep within the earth in the Marcellus Shale, where um, most of this gas is coming from, and um, also some heavy metals that are deep within the earth. So the gas that is coming through pipelines has all this other stuff with it. Um, and the next slide shows, and so those are the gas wells, and we're compressed. You're, Compressor stations and meeting regular stations are further down the line. And, um, and the next slide shows a, a pipeline from metering and regulating stations. And 
this is um, an example of what goes inside the pipelines. Every five to seven years, these pipelines have to be cleaned out because they get clogged, like arteries in a heart sometimes. And it's called pigging. And the um, black waste, solid waste that you see there is considered hazardous waste. And it has been tested and shown to have heavy metals and, that are toxic. And, um, oh, okay. And this is tiny and it didn't come out well, but it is um, a document from the um, energy company that shows the hazardous waste that is um, in the pipeline, including chromium, lead, and mercury, which are all toxic heavy metals. So compressor stations also produce emissions. So there is um, emissions from the natural operation of the compressor station. They have vents that are open, they have valves, there's engine exhaust because they burn the gas that is coming through them to um, power the compressor engine, and there are equipment leaks. Um, there are substantial emissions even when the compressor is not operating. <laughs> And the largest source of emissions are called blowdowns, and um, blowdowns are events that occur when a blowdown valve is opened and releases a plume of gas that goes 30 to 60 meters into the air, and it can last up for three hours. And blowdowns are part of the um, normal operation of a compressor station. They're used to normalize the pressure in the pipelines, and sometimes they are accidents. And um, Studies have concluded that compressor stations um, are the cause of more emissions than gas well pads where they're being drilled. And um, what comes out of the compressor station? Um, one of the things that um, Casey mentioned is noise. The noise of a compressor station operating has been likened to that of a jet engine going off at unpredictable times during the day or night. There's also a continuous hum that rattles the dishes in nearby houses and creates a, a constant low frequency noise that is reportedly very stressful. Persons living in close proximity to compressor stations have reported disruption of sleep and an increased problem with anxiety. And the World Health Organization acknowledges that noise pollution is a human health hazard. It raises blood pressure, it can raise the risk of heart attacks, and it can cause deficits in children, and in particular, difficulties with learning. Um, after the noise, we get to the chemicals. There's methane, which is the gas itself, but it also is a precursor for ground ozone and a contributor to smog formation and may cause worsening asthma and is linked to an increased risk of stroke and heart attacks. Nitrogen oxides are known air pollutants that are, cause respiratory disease like asthma, heart attacks, and neurologic disease. Particulate matter refers to tiny particles that are produced from the burning of fossil fuels. The tiniest ones of them can get deep into the lungs where they're not going to be cleared by our respiratory secretions, and they can sometimes even get into the bloodstream. And they've been well researched in studies about um, air pollution. And long-term exposure to particulate matter has been documented to cause an increase in mortality, so an increased number of deaths, um, increased number of respiratory problems like asthma, increased number of hospitalizations, and for women who are exposed during pregnancy, there's an increased risk of preterm births, autism in your children and, or their children, and low birth weight. Short-term exposure to these particles um, can harm sensitive individuals, like those who have chronic lung disease or people who have underlying heart disease. Next on the list is carbon monoxide. We know about that. Next on the list is volatile organic compounds like toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene. Toluene is toxic to the nervous system. All of these are um, known endocrine disruptors, and endocrine disruptors are um, chemicals that can interfere with human hormones at levels that are far below what the EPA considers safe exposure limits. Among the health conditions linked to endocrine disruptors are sperm abnormalities, fertility problems in women, reduced fetal growth, breast cancer, and neurologic disorders. There are over 100 known endocrine disruptors in the 1,000-plus chemicals used in fracking. 
Next are hazardous air pollutants um, is such as benzene and formaldehyde. Formaldehyde can irritate the nose, the sinuses, the respiratory tract, and may worsen asthma. It can also cause cancer in the long term. And benzene is a known carcinogen, even at low exposure, at, at um, very low concentrations for if in, in the case of long-term exposures. There's also radon, which is carried from the gas from the Marcello shale. It's um, a byproduct of the radioactive radium that is underground that is coming up with the um, fracked gas. And radon is the largest, um, the single largest cause of lung cancer in non-smokers and the second leading cause of cancer in lung, uh, lung cancer in smokers. Heavy metals um, and radioactive lead and PCBs are also likely or possibly included in the gas. This publication from Spectra um, confirms that the above listed toxins and air pollutants are in their gas. The top is nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, the volatile organic compounds, the particulate matter, and, and so on. Um, and and um, hazardous air pollutants. And the next slide shows um, the identity of the hazardous air pollutants and included, you, you can't see it very well, but is benzene and formaldehyde and toluene. So these are from the industry. So there's, there's no questioning the fact that these toxins are present in fracked gas. So what kind of public health studies have been done to protect our communities from, um, in the settings of compressor stations? Well, there have been none. There, um, there's no national or state inventory of compressor station accidents, and there's no body of peer-reviewed research um, showing the adverse health effects of compressor stations. All we have are a few small studies, of health surveys of symptoms near compressor stations. Um, <clears throat> So let's look at the, one of the few small health studies. This was a study done in New York. It involved only 35 residents. They um, had a new compressor station built within a mile of their house. And their symptoms included res, um, respiratory events, uh, probably throat irritation, that seems to be a common theme, and nosebleeds in 63% of the residents headaches in 34% and rashes in 29%. Um, things like formaldehyde can cause rashes. Um, and another study, it was shown that the closer the residence was to the compressor station, the more frequently you saw these symptoms. So bloody noses, headaches, and asthma were found in increasing frequency, and children seemed to suffer the most. Um, children especially those that lived within 1,500 um, feet of the compressor station. They had a 69% um, incidence of throat irritation and 69% um, incidence of severe headaches, and they had more frequent severe bloody noses than the adults. They also saw that children had unusual um, symptoms that are usually associated with adults, like diffuse joint pain. I know some of us can uh, identify with that. and um, Memory loss problems. These, were being, these symptoms were being seen in children, which is, is not a normal situation. So um, we're having to extrapolate on studies done in air pollution. And this is just a, a, a slide from our founding father, Kurt Norgaard, on the air pollution studies that have been done looking at particulate matter. Um, there have been over 200, there are 239 um, studies showing an association of stroke and particulate matter, over 2,000 studies showing an association of cardiovascular disease, and over 1,000 studies showing that asthma is associated with particulate matter, and nitrogen dioxide is also associated with asthma and cardiovascular disease, and it's well documented. Um, on the next slide, you can see some of the health effects you might expect for persons living close to a compressor station. Here's a person with chronic lung disease who has to be hospitalized because of the um, air pollution now in the community. Or a young kid who's just been diagnosed with asthma because of the new um, pollutants in the air around the compression station. Or uh, an individual who has known heart disease having a heart attack because of the air. Um, in the next slide, you'll see the events that you could expect. You could expect to see new diagnoses of asthma, new diagnoses of autism, 
increased clinic visits for asthma, people with respiratory cancers and chronic lung disease and diabetes. There'll be more hospitalizations for the people who have chronic lung disease, who have neurologic disease, who have diabetes or heart disease. And there'll be deaths. People who have respiratory cancers are more likely to die. People with chronic lung disease will be more likely to die. Same with those who have heart conditions and diabetes. So it depends on what you think of your neighbors as to whether or not you want a compressor station in your midst. <laughs> um, this slide is just a, a saying that even if, even if we don't have a compressor station, the gas that we use to cook our food has um, some health, adverse health effects. Um, a study done in homes that had gas stoves and vented to the outside versus homes that had gas stoves and didn't vent to the outside showed an increased risk of children with pediatric developing asthma in the homes that didn't vent their stoves to the outside. So my stove vents to the outside. <laughs> um, on the next slide, benzene is one of the chemicals that is present in fact gas. It is a known carcinogen. Um, there's really no safe level of benzene exposure, but um, 0 0.03 parts per billion is um, linked to leukemia, and that's in the next slide. And, um, if, and in the next slide, you'll see that um, spectra documents show that there is benzene in the Algonquin gas pipeline, and um, it's measured in tons per year, so that it's hard to calculate how much that would be in terms of exposure. And um, the next thing I wanted to mention is the radiation, the potential radiation exposure. No one has measured the radiation in the gas in, that comes into New England, but is very likely to be present. Um, then this study from Pennsylvania and the department, by the Department of Environmental Protection, there were um, measurable amounts of radon in all of these different um, fracked gas wells. There was none that had zero. Some had many more than others, but all of them had radon. Radon is um, a radioactive material. It only lasts four days, but then it decays to another radioactive um, chemical, radioactive lead, which lasts for years. So if you breathe in the radioactive radon, Maybe the radioactive radon won't stay in your system, but the radioactive lead that it would turn into would and could cause symptoms in the long run. And there just haven't been long-term studies to look at what fracked gas does in the long term because it's a new industry, it's a new technique. And this is just um, uh, sh documenting the radioactive <laughs> lead and a filter from a gas processing plant in Pennsylvania. So, in summary, is gas clean if it's burned? Gas is burned at compressor stations and metering and regulating stations. It's burned in our homes. The emissions from burning anywhere include major air pollutants, hazardous air pollutants, radon, possibly others, and possibly heavy metals. Is gas clean if it's leaked? Gas is leaked and vented at compressor stations and metering and regulating stations. There are leaks in the distribution pipelines, in our streets, and even in some homes at very low levels. The emissions from leak gas anywhere includes toxic and carcinogenic air pollutants, radon, possibly others, and possibly heavy metals. Um, this was just a um, sample of an event that occurred in Weymouth from their metering and regulating station back in January where a valve that was known to be faulty had been um, discovered months prior to this event to be a faulty valve, but they just hadn't gotten around to repairing it. Well, it, it, it um, froze open and leaked 200,000 cubic feet of gas over a period of a couple of hours before it was turned off. And um, it was, the gas smell was strong up to a mile away because of the prevailing winds. And that's a metering and regulating station. That's not a compressor station. Metering and regulating stations are smaller. So Casey and I and the Mass Healthcare Providers Against Frac Gas feel that we need more information. We feel that before we allow these projects to go forward, we need a comprehensive 
health assessment and health impact assessment. And there, is, there are bills before the state. One is being sponsored by my state rep, um, Ed Coppinger. It's bill number H3391. Write this down, talk to your state rep, talk to your state senators, and ask for their support. It um, is a act relative to the energy siting, um, energy facility siting board asking for a comprehensive health impact assessment to be completed before <laughs> approval is given for any natural gas infrastructure projects in the state of Massachusetts. And um, I thank you for your attention tonight, and I don't know if anyone has any questions for me or Casey or Elizabeth, um, but that's the summary of my talk. Yes? Yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, for example, yesterday's leak in Providence. Right. Is there a follow-up study after each leak to see if there are any increases in illnesses <coughs> that just happen to arise within, um, within that time of the leak? Like, say, they follow up in the next five years to mm -hmm. see if all of a sudden there's a rush of asthma or, or <coughs> attacks and somewhat healthy people? Not to my knowledge. I'm, I'm not aware of any structure to look at human health in the setting of natural gas infrastructure projects. Yes? Yeah, you talked about cleaning those pipes every five to seven years. Is that a monitored process or is it just done at their discretion? It's done at their discretion. But the waste that is generated is considered hazardous and has to well, be disposed of. It has to be monitored because what do they do with the waste? The new Bedford metering and regulating station that was um, the source for the, the slide that showed that it was hazardous waste, that waste is um, taken back to Texas and buried. Oh. But there's no way of knowing <laughs> they're cleaning the pipes or not. Right. Well, they have to clean the pipes, otherwise they, they'll get blocked with all the debris. So they're cleaning the pipes so that they can, they're, um, the gas keeps going, flowing through. And if all these chemicals are released with these leaks, there's tens of thousands of leaks in Massachusetts. Right. Why aren't they repaired? And why isn't that area monitored where they can be repaired and the chemicals aren't being released? Really That's a good question. Me, it seems to me if they fix the leaks, they wouldn't need to put any more pressure in the line. That's a very good point. <laughs> and just keep in mind, too, that um, these proposals are for line expansions. So the, uh, similar to what we were hearing about from Elizabeth is that this is a, a spectra is trying to say you need more gas, so we have to put these compressor stations in, which is contrary to the evidence from uh, the state attorney general's office. So um, that's an important point to remember when talking to your community. Yes. Um, on the study that you showed from the new compressor station that has had those symptoms come up, is there any like timeline, like from when the compressor station was brought online to when there was an increase in those um, health symptoms? Um, the first one from New York, it was within the first year. Within the first year. The, the point being made about the difference between this gas line pipeline expansion and where the, these noted gas leaks are coming from, that's from the distribution system, so from your local gas service provider. Um, they have always repaired um, gas leaks, um, and in 2014, the legislature decided they weren't repairing them fast enough. They also... Um, decided to change the structure of how the gas companies could pay for the re repair work to be done. Um, so starting in 2014, some, some new plans were um, required and have been um, implemented over the last couple of years. So more repair work is being done. Um, it's, it, it's obviously not addressing all the, the leaks. One challenge, there's two challenges of that that face all gas companies in repairing those leaks. One is um, the cost, because all ratepayers, all gas ratepayers pay for that. So there's a balance between how fast you repair all the, the work, uh, the leaks, and how much your, the, the Department of Public Utilities is willing to allow the companies to spend to do that work. And then the second piece is um, that there are, actually aren't enough 
trained individuals to do the work to repair the gas leaks in the Commonwealth. So it's kind of a job creator. <laughs> so hopefully, um, like I said, it's only since 2014 that this bill passed, so there's been more and more work done, and I, I apologize that I, I don't work on those um, cases. We have um, experts in my office who work on all of those cases. Uh, there's the uh, acronyms are GSEPs and GRECs. One is kind of the plan that they have, and one is the, the recouping of the money. Um, so we're looking at that, and since 2014 there has been a ramp up, and I think it's over, it's close to, it's over 2% of gas leaks that are being repaired every year, which seems it's a small amount, but it's more than what they were doing before, and our office is keeping an eye on, um, or keeping the pressure on to make sure that they continue to do that and do it in a responsible way so that the money they are spending is being spent in the right way. So part, you know, that's why we're keeping involved in, in these cases, to make sure, again, that the money's being spent the right way um, and that it's being spent on repairs. Uh, part of the challenge is the measurement of those leaks. And there is a great debate around the country and certainly in the Commonwealth of how do you measure those leaks and um, what the, uh, the gas utilities can actually recoup in terms of lost gas uh, uh, associated with those leaks. So we have been actively involved in, uh, in DC about how to, to do that and how to measure those leaks because we, we agree, we don't think that they should be just nilly-willy um, covering their costs on, on leaks. They should be repairing them and also, you know, they should be measuring them properly. So we've, we've been engaged in a debate in DC on that and then it's something we pay attention to quite closely at the department. I have one more question. Uh, <coughs> everyone talks about the transmission lines leaking. It doesn't even make sense on its face that, I mean, the distribution lines are the ones that are being, they're the ones that are being counted. Nobody's counting the transmission lines leaks. I mean, Spectre seems to be in control of that entirely, and they're not required to report it to anyone unless wetlands are directly involved, at least here in Hoboken. Isn't there some way to introduce controls over the condition, having the transmission line itself? It's an interstate system. But it, is, that just, is it just the Wild West out there? Is that what you've got going? I, I don't have enough background to fully answer that question other than to say that uh, pipelines like the Spectra pipeline are um, regulated by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So it should be a part of a, any FERC certificate to grant the ability to build those pipelines. Well, as I understand it, uh, FEMSA only requires every seven years. That's why I said it should be. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a question. Yeah, so my question was uh, similar to Tracy's here is, you know, we, we always talk about distribution line and it's 10,000 leaks and 20,000 leaks, but you know, what's going through here and what's impacting our neighborhood is transmission lines. There's no studies on that. I don't know how conditioned these things are put in the 60s. I don't know what the condition these pipes are. They want to add 35% more pressure. I mean, 35% of my gas increase the pressure of the pressure of the station to get up to no motion. So what's, you know, like, no one knows what the condition of these things are. Not even FERC, you know, FERC sits in Washington DC says, check them out, sure, go ahead. Um, <laughs> I just didn't know, like I agree with Tracy, there's never something that the state can do to look into this to say, hey, uh, what are the conditions of these pipes, you know? Was that a leak? Uh, another quick question, the leaking problems, was that a transmission like So I don't have an answer to answer your question, what? but I'll ask around the office. I, uh, you know, two quick things that come to my head, top of my head is what is required in an EFSB, the Energy Facility Siting Board, it's mentioned up here, um, and then what about, as Tracy mentioned, wetlands, what about the Department of Ener um, Environmental Protection, what sort of certificates are granted under their authority and how do they measure that? So that's so, so I'll, something I'll bring back to the office. And Elizabeth, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, more recently the Weymouth uh, proposed compressor station site is a little ahead of where you're at. There's been increased attention and pressure um, from citizens put on Governor Baker to provide a more clear answer about um, his ability to participate in FERC's decision making. So uh, for things that you don't get a clear answer on tonight, it, it's a good opportunity to use that same question 
and direct it towards the governor's office. Um, and there are opportunities for your voice to be even louder if you're listening to NPR. There were people calling in recently when Governor Baker was um, on air during their midday show. So even if you don't get an answer here, it's still a very good question. And, and on that wet Weymouth, I know your slides noted it, it started with the Atlantic Bridge project. So that's, and unfortunately, that the start of that Weymouth compressor station has gr been granted um, FERC approval. But it was going to be expanded under the Access Northeast proposal. So Rehope, there's gonna, there would be a Rehoboth compressor station and an even bigger Weymouth compressor station. So you have a lot of compatriots in Weymouth that um, you can you know, obviously learn from and team up with. Well, there's a lot of hands. <laughs> uh, this side has some, we'll get to everyone. So as it stands right now, are you saying that there are no requirements where they have to filter anything right now? They can just spew anything into the air? And there must be some kind of filtration that they're required to, to use, no? Mm -hmm. I, I don't work on enough of these issues to answer that question. There are requirements, but they are not sufficient because the um, chemicals that are being spewed have much higher thresholds than are than um, are really safe for human health. So they need to be um, further studied and addressed. But there are air pollution standards, and there um, those documents were their estimation, which would fall under the. And I, I can add to that. I mean, basically in this country, this whole thing began with energy independence. That's what the goal was. And in order for that to happen with very little restriction, there, the EPA really didn't have the sort of role that it should have, and that continues to be the case. And even now you hear a lot of talk about energy independence or even generating more coal. But it, it, on its face, it doesn't even make sense. We have more gas than we can even use domestically. Why would we start coal up at this juncture on top of everything else? So the regulations themselves are not stringent enough, and they were designed that way. So I just, that's my take anyway on that. On December 16th, uh, the Canadian pipeline company Enbridge purchased Spectra for $28 billion. So now, this whole system is owned by a Canadian company. How does that fit in with the potential of gaining, taxing or gaining money from all of the uh, electric users in this country to pay for the pipeline that now belongs to a Canadian company? <laughs> okay, the United States of America, American customers using electricity. And the question is, should we put a fee on their electric bill, which was what that the the tax that was you know uh, defeated uh, recently, um, and other ways to try to get money from the users of the electricity, which would be the United States of America electrical customers. But the company that now owns all of this pipeline infrastructure, which was formerly Spectra, a Houston-based company, is now Enbridge which is a Canadian company, no longer the United States. So is it really correct, is it really right for these uh, Americans to be paying for this Canadian company's expansion and profits? And also, it also brings up another question as uh, comes to mind is that, well, now that the <coughs> pipeline is owned by a Canadian company, can we really assume that all of this gas is going to go to our electric companies since that is going to be very easy for to go straight up the camera and double the price? I think those are excellent questions and are great that for the federal be, um, delegation. Yeah, a good, that would be another good one to ask. <laughs> double the price. It shows it leaves this country. Yeah, it shows how <laughs> complex the legal issues are surrounding this. It's definitely beyond my area of knowledge with this and um, but I think it shows that it's not just as simple as, well, a company wants to put something in and we need those things sometimes, so we should all just kind of accept it and move on. Yeah. So very good questions. My understanding is that the majority of the gas from these new pipeline projects will be um, slated for export. 
Okay, cool. Certainly mm-hmm. looks good if you're a Canadian company and you own it all now, doesn't right. it? Right. Yeah. Eighty-six mm-hmm. percent or more. Right? Sure. Yeah, of right. course, as soon as yeah. all of that gas mm-hmm. leaves this country, the supply, which right now we have a large amount of it, mm-hmm. which keeps the price low because the demand is not high because the supply is immense. As soon as that supply becomes less, the demand will go up and the price will go up here as well. <coughs> Two in a row, but Go ahead. Um, just and this this probably comes under the attorney general's office, but maybe not. I mean, it seems what they're proposing is always the utility companies are always proposing expansion of capacity, and we've said that part of the solution is really conservation. Nobody's pushing conservation. I mean, we buy energy efficient appliances, and you can get an energy audit done if you're aware of the fact that that they're even available to you, and every once in a while. You'll get a coupon in your electric bill that says we'll give you fifty dollars to take away your old refrigerator. Well, it's never a good time to, to do that. But nobody's saying, hey, maybe you should walk around your house and turn off the light, or maybe you should run your washing machine after ten o'clock at night. When I mean, simple things like that, and nobody's doing that. And I, I think that's sort of a that could fall under the governor's office or the attorney general's office, and nobody's doing that. And that's sort of fundamental. And it just seems that we could reduce our energy demand by 10%, 15% with just, hey, everybody, let's run a commercial every night. Do you need all those lights on? I can't agree more. Um, our, our office has a seat on the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council. Um, right now, we're in the middle of a three-year energy efficiency plan that is the most aggressive in the nation. It's aiming for 3% energy efficiency. We've been at this for since 2008. We've changed all the light, almost all the light bulbs we're going to change. We need to get into deeper efficiencies and more of that education about, you know, we all, we, our parents yelled at us when we le- left our room, you know, turn off the light. I live with my parents so <laughs> Exactly. So we need someone else to remind us. Um, so that's really something that's come out of this study for us is what creative ways can we embark upon to make that happen more. And so we, we tried something at the legislature last summer. People, the, the people who are in charge of energy efficiency programs got mad at us and they stopped it. But we wanted to have a different look at our energy efficiency programs. We wanted to get more aggressive and we wanted to kind of mix it up and look at it. And unfortunately, there's a lot of money in that. Um, so some, some interested parties put an end to it. But it's not something that we're, we're done with. Um, and so our seat on the EEAC is about pushing those boundaries, and that includes what sort of marketing our utilities are doing. Our utilities run our energy efficiency programs. What marketing are they doing? Are they hitting all the targets? And that's, that's been a constant complaint. And then on top of that, the work that we do in our more traditional um, cases, um, is part of that is about modernizing our grid and making sure all the poles and wires can adapt to evolving technologies, including those technologies that help us manage our energy use. In terms of, you know, uh, the programmable thermostat looks a lot different than that one on the wall. Um, Using washing machines, you know, programming them to to work overnight when our electricity costs are low and our, our load is low. So those sort of things, that work, that, that comes into our repair advocacy for sure, and it's going to continue in order for us to, to address some of these issues. Does the Attorney General's Office have the authority uh, that you would be able to, for instance, avoid preemption by federal law? If you were concerned about the effect that the press station has, and based upon some of the preliminary numbers that the the nurse practitioner and the doctor gave about the effect on public health within a proximity or radius of the plant. Don't you have the ability, as the Attorney General's Office, and, and again, we referenced a bill that's been pending that one of the state reps has talked about uh, doing examination, but I think your office, if I'm not mistaken, would have the ability under your, uh, under your authority as the State Attorney General to exercise its power to possibly block uh, the implementation of the construction of the plan pending comprehensive studies on the effect, the health effect uh, amongst the residents, the population. We're all aware that 
in the past, different projects that have been proposed have been blocked by advocates for the environment on the effect of flora on fauna and fauna, things like that. Well, this is probably the most intrinsic problem that we're dealing with, which is the effect on human health, human habitability. So it would seem to me that this would be uh, exactly what the Attorney General's office could do and not even be hampered by whether or not you can, you can build a political caucus or a political uh, uh, critical mass behind the bill. Your office might have the ability to do this. If we could, if, if, if we could get some of these preliminary studies and showings that these people have, have graciously given us uh, to build on that, that might be a very important factor. So a couple reactions to that. First of all, in the work that we've been doing, particularly under Maura Healy's leadership, um, with respect to our advocacy at FERC, so when we're weighing in uh, at FERC, we're bringing those ideas in. You know, there's, there is, tends, tends to be a lack of scientific research, but when we're advocating, we, we did it with the Weymouth compressor station when that proposal went to FERC. We asked questions about public health. What sort of impact is this going to have on public health, in addition to environmental impacts? But under Maura Healy's leadership, she's thinking about energy in different ways that doesn't just think about environment, doesn't just think about dollars and cents, but thinks about all those other issues, including public health. Um, you know, instances of, of asthma, you know, cancer rates, all of that. So that's coming into our work, and it has shown in some of our work in, at FERC. I think one of the challenges, and, and you, you sort of referenced it because there's a bill at, um, at the, the legislature, and it's been filed a number of times and by different people, and we're coming up into a very busy legislative period, and I'm sure that it will be discussed during the budget debate and, and some other aspects. The, there, is, there are bills that would add a, another requirement at the EFSB, the, um, uh, the, the siting board, um, that, has, that forces the siting board to examine public health. Right now their charge is spelled out of what they examine when they're looking at a proposal and public health is not called out. We have inferred that it's in another aspect of their charge and we, um, so, so, and we and others have inferred that, but there is a bill that would explicitly state that. So that's one thing that's going on, and we'll see what happens. Um, I think the more that these sort of discussions happen, the more groundswell of support comes for, you know, for that. Um, but that's, that's one thing that we are keeping an eye on and thinking about when it comes to citing board issues. I think that's, that's kind of where we can really get at it. Because we do face a challenge, and, and uh, unfortunately we faced it in, in recent times, that when it comes to, to the siting of gas pipelines, FERC retains exclusive jurisdiction because of the Natural Gas Act. So we have to be creative, and we have to work within the bounds of the law, and those are you know, two ways that we're trying to do it. But, it, but your point's well made, and, and certainly is, has been injected in the work that we do. Uh, what agency or politicians, federal, state, local, should we target to, I mean, you're speaking to the public. <coughs> Everybody agrees. So we obviously need to put some kind of push on someone. Yeah. So first of all, I think you're already doing the best thing that you can, is that, that's educating yourselves. So then you're not just complaining, you know, what people, you know, will charge NIMBY. You're not, that's not what you're doing. You're educating yourselves, having healthcare, you know, officials in and, or, or practitioners in, learning those issues. What really could you be facing um, so that you have educated talking points? Um, that's great. So you guys are already ahead of the game. So in terms of who to talk to, certainly your local um, legislators. Uh, Senator and Rep, um, and I, I saw that Senator Timothy. I saw he tweeted a couple weeks ago that he may have met with you. Um, I follow him on Twitter, um, uh, and then uh, so your your Rep too. Um, certainly the governor. I mean yeah. we've we've heard a couple of instances. The governor um, he appoints the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, who is in charge of the Department of Environmental Protection the Department of Agriculture, 
uh, and the, the Department of Public Utilities. So governor, secretary of EEA, and then the commissioners of all of those agencies. The DPU acts as an adjudicator, so it's harder to talk to the DPU, but doesn't mean you can't talk to their bosses and put their, the pressure on there. And then, you know, we've, we've got a federal delegation that is really up on these issues and is engaged, but it doesn't hurt to reach out to them and to continue to press um, because who knows what gonna, we're going to face in the next couple of years with respect to FERC. Right now we don't have enough commissioners at FERC uh, to really actually do anything. Um, they're going to be appointed, but there's going to be a change. I think the other thing to consider is when you are speaking with um, your personal friends, just uh, being very clear, using easy to understand language, follow, you know, one, two points, because it's really hard later in the day after everything's happened for people to remember, well, what, why was I supposed to say something about that? Um, and also, if, if you're talking to your neighbors, giving them the very direct instruction of when the vote is, um, who their state rep is, who to contact, how to do it, how long it will take them, because I found that in our line of work in primary care, we're always trying to get people to follow up at the next step. And the more that someone knows what to expect, the more likely they are, I think, to follow through. So that can be helpful at getting more pressure to all of those points. You know, I do think that there's a groundswell of advocacy and understanding in the state around these issues. You've got some great really great educated folks down in Okushnet who are pushing back on this project. Mm -hmm. You have great people in Weymouth who are pro pushing back on this project. S um, Sharon, you know, the folks that lived on the, that are gonna, that would live on the pipeline. Come, you guys have been, you, you can, yeah, you know, join together. There's power in numbers. Um, and I think that you're all working towards the same thing, um, you know, there was one example cited of a, a Weymouth resident who called the governor when he was live on radio and really put him on the spot. Look for opportunities to get your message across in different ways. Get everybody you know to the polls, right? Oh, no.